हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाई जूज एग्जाम प्रेप आई एस वेरी वेरी वॉम गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन आई होप ऑल यूर डूइंग गुड वी आर अ डे आफ्टर द प्रिलिम्स एग्जामिनेशन मे बी सम ऑफ यू डिड अटेम्प्ट द प्रिलिम्स एग्जामिनेशन फॉर ये स्टडे इफ यू डिड नॉट आई होप ऑल यू हैव एट लीस्ट सीन द पेपर एंड हैव एनालाइज दैट एज वेल वी आर बैक वंस अगेन विद आर हिंदू न्यूज पेपर अनालिस वेर वी टेक अप ऑन द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स ऑन द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर एंड वी डिस्कस दैट इन एंड आउट फॉर बोथ द मेन्स एंड द प्रिलिम्स एग्जामिनेशन पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू Before that, quickly a reminder: there are just a couple of days left for the ongoing mega scholarship offer that is running right here. All that you have to do is click on the link given in the comment section. There will be a pinned comment, and you will be taken to the website where you can actually register for this offer. These are the topics that we have taken up for today, from the mains examination point of view and from the prelims point of view. I know all of you. Are pretty eager to discuss about the prelims examination as well for yesterday. Don't worry, we will have a small discussion about the prelims examination as well as we go on. But let's first focus on what is our agenda for the day. From the mains examination point of view, we will be discussing couple of articles from international relations point of view. First, China and the U.S. rivalry that is ongoing right now, and the two countries are banning each other's companies. which are conducting business in each other's territory second we will be discussing about japan how japan is preparing for a much more aggressive china by increasing its military spending as well then we will be discussing why 1.5 degree celsius target is critical and what will happen if we do not really abide by that from the prelims examination point of view we will be discussing some other interesting details about the new parliament building that was inaugurated yesterday a new falcon pendulum was placed here we'll be discussing what that is how that works then there is a report that has come out which shows india has done well in stunting but in wasting and obesity india still is lagging behind as compared to other countries <clears throat> and in the end we'll be discussing how dengue is a nationwide infection and what is it that we can do to control that as well this is the first article for the day The first article basically focuses on the U.S. <clears throat> and China rivalry that is ongoing for a long time now. Now you would say that U.S.-China rivalry is not really a new news story. <clears throat> It has been happening for a long, long time. However, there is a very interesting twist in the U.S.-China rivalry that has happened recently. This is that the two sides are now banning each other's country companies. So, for example, China recently has been banning a lot of U.S. companies which are working in the chip manufacturing sector. Chip manufacturing sector seems to be the latest point of contention between the two sides. While the U.S. says that the Chinese companies working in the U.S. are stealing their data, on the other hand, China says that the American companies are taking undue advantage of Chinese market as well. this is why the two sides are now face to face with each other banning each other's companies now the interesting part is if you go back a few decades do you know us and china were actually friends in fact us china and pakistan used to be friends that is something that did not go well with india that is why for example in the 1971 war when india was fighting against pakistan us came for the help of pakistan so us china and pakistan used to be that axis where they used to be very very close to each other while india had to find a new friend and he found it in the form of ussr however now the situation has changed the us china issues have come very very strongly at the forefront of the relationship between the two sides although there is trade between the two sides still but there is an ongoing trade war you would remember when donald trump was the american president he had banned a lot of chinese companies from operating in the us he even had imposed multiple tariffs on the chinese products coming into the american territory now china has also retaliated china has said that we also would treat the american companies the same way when they come to our country and when they try to take advantage in the past few years us had tried to deny any latest technology going into china 
meaning that what the US has done, US has made a rule that most of its companies cannot share their latest up-to-date technology with those companies that are in China. So technology denial to China is one of the techniques that they are using. However, China is still being able to invest a lot of money. China is still being able to give a boost to their own country. What has happened recently is, I don't know how many of you have heard of this company called NVIDIA. If you do follow technology related news, NVIDIA was in the news last week. It had announced a lot of great developments in the field of AI. They are a chip manufacturing company all around the world. Their stock market value increased considerably just in a few days. The chief of NVIDIA has said that if there is a crisis between the US and China, especially in the chip industry, it will harm the US very, very, very badly. Because China makes up one third of the US industry's market and they cannot replace and they cannot have any new alternative. The reason why this is in the news is China recently banned an American company called Micron. Now Micron is a very big American company that is into making ch chips and works on the AI technology. It has been banned in China recently because China says that they are taking undue advantage of the Chinese market. The problem with China is many countries say that China actually steals IP, intellectual property. Do you know when China has to buy a new weapon, any new missile, any new plane, etc. What they do is they buy one of those things only from the other country. Then they reverse engineer it. They open all the parts and they see what is it made of so that they can copy and make their own versions. China does this in almost every sector. That is why not many countries want to share their technology with China because China has been known to steal IP, that is, in, that is intellectual property. However, the good part is that China has invested very, very heavily in its tech and in the education sector. The problem on the other hand with the US is US is not really successful in resolving its dispute with other countries. There are multiple examples in the past. US had a dispute with Iran, they were not able to resolve it. US had a dispute with Afghanistan, they went to Afghanistan, they spent trillions of dollars. Not even billions, they sent, spent trillions of dollars and even then they had to come out of Afghanistan without achieving anything. USA wanted to stop the Ukraine-Russia war, they were not able to do that. So US has not really had any successful example to show to the world of how they can resolve their disputes. And this is why even with China, there is no clarity whether US would be able to resolve the dispute that they have with China, at least not with the current policies. As I said, the reason that this topic is in the news once again is that China has banned the American company Micron. This is a company that works in the chip manufacturing sector. It's a US company. It has a big, big market in China, but China has banned it. Now, this might sound like very odd because usually other nations ban the Chinese companies. For example, US has banned Huawei. That is a Chinese company working in the telecom sector on the allegations that they steal data. This is the reason why India has also banned TikTok and the Chinese apps as well. Because again, we have reasons to believe that Chinese apps, Chinese companies steal our data and they submit it to the Chinese government. But now China thinks that they are strong enough to even ban the other companies and this is what they have done. If you look at the history of US-China chip war, this is an ongoing war because the two countries right now know this for a fact that who will become the next real superpower, who will be the country that will be the true global superpower in the next century will be determined by technology, by AI, by chip, which is the two country that has monopoly over chip manufacturing, which, is the two, which are the two countries that know how to make the best use of chips. This is where the two countries are now fighting with each other. It's not a face-to-face -face war which involves weapons. It's a war that involves technology. US has been making rules, not allowing its companies to share technology with the Chinese companies. China, on the other hand, has been investing a lot of money into their own company so that they can develop their technology. Now, <clears throat> China has also been known to have hackers as a part of their armed forces. Many Chinese hackers have been given the responsibility to hack into American companies, to hack into all other nations' secret data. 
so that they know what is the plan of the other countries. There are allegations that China has been behind multiple cyber attacks in case of India as well and not just with case of US. Also, how is it that the semiconductors are important? How do they actually become such a big issue? Please understand, semiconductor chips are mainly dependent upon how thick they are. Meaning that the thinner the chip, the more valuable it is. Have you realized how the television sets that we used to have during our parents' time used to be this thick, then television sets become this, became this thinner, and now television sets are just this thin. The reason why all these technology, all these devices that we have in our, at our hands are becoming smaller and shorter with more power is because all the devices, all the components are decreasing in size. The same is the case here with semiconductor chips as well. The thinner that your semiconductor chip would be, the better, the more advanced it would be. Right now, China wants to have 5 nanometer to or 7 nanometer manufacturing, but they are not able to do that. That is why they want more technology. China has been a leader in terms of AI, quantum computing or 5G, but in chip manufacturing, they are still lagging. On the other hand, the one nation or nation oblique, not a nation, according to China, that is doing very well in chip manufacturing is Taiwan. Taiwan is considered as the world leader when it comes to making chips which are very, very, very thin and they are very advanced. The more thin the chip is, the more expensive it would be in the market, the more advanced it would be. Taiwan right now is a country or again region or country, whatever, on which China is dependent. China still imports most of these very, very thin chips from Taiwan only. In fact, more than 90% of really advanced chips in the world are made in Taiwan right now. And this is why Taiwan has such importance in the entire world when it comes to manufacturing of semiconductor chips. And China also realizes that. I'll also share with you one very interesting thing. See, you might say that the two countries, let's say US and China, for example, that US and China don't have good relations, that US and China are not really uh, on good terms with each other. But do you know, despite all these problems between the two countries, the trade always continues. And it's not just US and China, even Taiwan and China. Taiwan also called as a Chinese Taipei and China. Now you know that these two are not in good terms with each other, but even then, do you see the trade between the two? I'll just give you an example. From China to Taiwan, the exports were $77.6 billion and from Taiwan to China, the exports were about $126 billion. Means China-Taiwan trade also was about $200 billion. Just imagine. Despite all that, that we hate you, we will attack you, we will bring you in our country. Despite all of that, the trade still continues to be very strong. Same is the case with US and China. Look at the numbers of US and China. This is a trade of 2021. Exports from China to US, $530 billion, just imagine. And exports from US to China, $151 billion. Means, if you look at the trade between the two sides, it is $681 billion. So US and China may be, I won't say enemies, but may be adversaries of each other, may be talking against each other, may be banning each other companies. But even then, do you see? how much trade they continue to have. So please do not think that relationship between any two countries is the same in every sector. It might not be the same in trade. It might not be the same in any other aspect. That is where you have to understand how relationship between the two sides keeps on changing. That was our first article. Before I go into the second one, there are a lot of people discussing about yesterday's paper. So I'll just... I'll just uh, make a couple of remarks about yesterday's paper. Uh, see, it was a tough paper first. There is no denying that fact. it was a tough paper. And it was a tough paper in both sense. That is, it was a tough paper in the sense that the options were, or the way that the options were formed were tough. And the CSAT paper also was not the easiest of the papers. However, if you have read or if you have prepared sincerely for the last one year or 15 months or whatever the period is, 
I do not think that you should score less than 95 to 100. That is what my assessment is. Yes, the options were not really to your liking, but there were a lot of things that you knew that will be asked. For example, the cobalt thing, as Shadab is saying, I asked you the cobalt thing, which country produces the most cobalt. If you remember, there are so many times that we have discussed about green hydrogen and we kept on telling you time and time again, green hydrogen is important, green hydrogen is important, the government has been focusing a lot. There were two questions on green hydrogen. Did you, did you realize that? Then we also discussed the fact that they were also talk about gold, the gold export thing. Switzerland again came into question. There were every little chance that if you see the map of Ukraine, Afghanistan, there will be a map based question. If you saw the map of Ukraine, if you remembered, you would have been able to answer. So there were a lot of questions you would have been able to answer. Yes, there were a bit of questions that were pretty tough. But in UPSC, you always expect some questions to be unreachable. At least if you look at it, let's say from history point of view. History last year was much, much tougher as compared to the history that came in this year. Polity, most of the questions were doable. So in science and tech also, most of the questions came in from the current affairs. There was a star based question. If you read about solar system, even the most basic, you would be able to answer the star based question. There was a question on missiles, Brahmos, Agni, very easy question to answer. So yes, there were difficult questions. There were difficult options. But yes, it's not to say that the paper was completely undoable. Yes, the kind of options that we had were slightly difficult, but I don't think that a serious aspirant would be struggling with only 60, 65 marks. If you are prepared well, I don't think 1995 was unachievable. You should have been able to do that very, very well. But again, my assessment and our assessment was that if you saw our session yesterday night, our assessment is that the cutoff for general may be about <clears throat> 83 to 85. That's a general cutoff assumption. Even if you're scoring 75 plus from any answer key whatsoever, I'm sure you would have consulted different answer keys as you should. Even if you're scoring 75 plus on most of the answer keys, I would suggest you to start preparing for the mains examination. The reason being these years, the result for the prelims examination comes in very soon. So you just have to wait for my maximum of three weeks. Don't stop your preparation for three weeks. Keep on continuing your preparation for three more weeks. Let the result come out and then decide. But at least don't waste these three weeks because that can be very, very, very crucial for all of you. That is what my suggestion is. Now let me come back. If you have any comments, uh, questions for the first uh, article, please let me know before I go on to the second one. Ashu is saying, why is US lacking mediating policy and can we say that China has a potential to emerge as a global leader? Yes, Ashu, China has emerged as a global leader. I don't think that they will be emerging. They have emerged. On the other hand, why US mediates, it's because maybe US lacks a bit of understanding about different cultures. When you have this feeling that you are a world power for so many years, for so many decades, you have a feeling that you can go anywhere and you will make things better. You have a feeling that you can go anywhere and solve any problem. You are not humble enough to accept that you might not know a lot of things. That is what is the problem with the US right now. Then I have a question. Adarsh is saying, is Chinese economy too big to be boycotted? Uh, kind of. Not the entire economy, but yes, the manufacturing part at least, yes. The manufacturing part of the Chinese economy is too big to be boycotted because if you boycott it, it will be harmful for other countries only because you would have to file alternative first. So first find alternatives and then you can think about whether or not you would be able to boycott Chinese economy or not. Prathmesh is saying why Taiwan is dominating in semiconductor chair. So Prathmesh, <coughs> Taiwan was one of the first nations, oblique regions, whatever you want to call it, to realize the importance of semiconductor chips. They have been investing in this technology for a very, very long time, much, much earlier than the other countries. So they have the first mover advantage, they have the technology, they have been working on this and that is why they stand at the pole position right now. Okay, I'll take one last and then we will go ahead. Is it good for India that to China become friends with US, it will help us mediating between China, US becoming friends will not really happen. See, when the two countries are looking for one single spot that is at the top, you can't expect to be to them to be friends because they're at the top, there's only one space for a global superpower. 
So it will be very hypothetical to say US China becoming friends. That will not happen. Okay, let's go ahead then. The next article that we have here is from the point of view of Japan. Japan recently hosted the G7. Our Prime Minister also participated, although India is not a member of the G7. Over here, the article is mainly about what J Japan has been doing in the past few years. Now, Japan is a very interesting country. If you look at the history of Japan, how Japan has changed its stand in the defense sector, it's very, very interesting. So usually when you read world history, you will see that in world history, you read the chapter of the Second World War. The chapter ends by telling you that there were atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then it ends. But you don't know what happened after that. The Second World War did not just eventually end or Japan-US relationship did not just end after the dropping of the atomic bombs. So when the atomic bombs were dropped, after that what happened was America was scared that Japan will try to take revenge from America after a few years. It will lead to the Third World War because that is how the Second World War started, right? Germany wanted to take revenge of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles, that they were ashamed, etc. So they started the Second World War. America thought maybe Japan would also do the same, that they would also want to take revenge, that would start the Third World War. So what America wanted to do was, America wanted to make sure this doesn't happen. So American forces remained in Japan for a long time after Second World War ended. What they wanted to do was, they wanted to make sure in the Japanese society, there is no feeling of revenge. Second thing that America did was, America made a new constitution for Japan. So the new constitution of Japan that exists even today was made with the help of the American journals, made with the help of American armed forces that were in America. That is why even today you will see that the Japanese constitution has a lot of points very similar to the American constitution because they are built on the same lines. However, the most interesting part of Japanese constitution was it is written Japanese government cannot officially start a war. Japanese government cannot officially start a war. This is written in their constitution. It was written because America wanted it. That officially Japan just cannot start a war. They can defend themselves if they are being attacked, but they cannot start a war. That is why, do you know, Japanese army is not called the Japanese army. It's called Japanese self-defense army. They have a Japanese self-defense air force. They have a Japanese self-defense navy. They don't have Japanese navy. It's called Japanese self-defense navy. Because again, the concept is in their constitution, it's written that they can't start a war. Not just this, America has also given them a guarantee that you don't have to develop nuclear weapons. <clears throat> we will help you. If you need nuclear weapons, you are being attacked. We will supply you nuclear weapons. That is why for a very, very, very long time, Japan never engaged in any military buying or spending. They usually only bought weapons from America. They did not uh, sell weapons to anyone for a long time. Japan had reduced its military spending also for a long time. Japan also for a long time did not even used to take part in joint military exercises. But all of that has changed in the past two decades. With the beginning of the 21st century, with the rise of China, and just China and Japan don't have a good history, Japan and China also have some territorial disputes on some small islands. This is why Japan now, as you see, has been changing its approach when it comes to its defense sector. So <clears throat> Japan has been increasing its defense buying. Japan has been buying much more weapons. Japan, in fact, has even agreed to sell some of the weapons to India, although the deal has not finalized. But Japan has some amphibian aircrafts. Amphibian aircrafts means Aircraft that can land on water and that can land on uh, the land surface as well. Japan wanted to sell these to India. We have a negotiation going on for a long time. So Japan has now started to change its approach, not just because of China, but because they are very near to those areas where there is a conflict. Japan territorially is a neighbor of Russia, very close to each other because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Japan also is very, very close geographically to North Korea. Again, North Korea has been threatening with its nuclear program. So all these problems mean that Japan right now is very close to a lot of dangerous places in the world. And that is why Japan has been increasing its spending on national security, defense, military, etc. The good part with India is 
India and Japan have been partners in many different areas. So if Japan increases its military spending, it's good for us as well. Because Japan and India, both of us have a common adversary in China. China and India have a border dispute at the land. China and Japan also have a border dispute that is some of the islands. So if Japan does better, if Japan becomes stronger militarily and they focus more on China, it will be important for us as well that we collaborate with them. As I said, Japan has been in talks with India to sell a few amphibian aircrafts. Since Japan and India have been collaborating on many other platforms such as the COD, such as the G4, this also brings in good news for India. Now, this is a graph I wanted to show you. If you actually see this, this graph shows you in the past few years, see from this, from about 2017 onwards, their military spending has increased considerably. If you see here, let's change the pen, from 2017 onwards, Japan's military spending has gone above 2% of its GDP. Earlier, they used to be below 2% for a long time. Now they have suddenly increased it and they will increase it in the future. And this is again a sign that Japan realizes that maybe the threat from China is a much bigger threat just to be dependent on USA. We have to do and prepare on our own as well. This was our second article for the day. Before we go ahead, let me take a few comments again. Yes, Shunna, there was a question on Japanese satellite navigation system. Again, pretty easy question to answer, I think. Rahul is saying, why can't Japan change their own constitution in their own country? Is there any threat from America? No, no, Rahul. They can change their own constitution. I'll tell you a very fun fact. Not a fun fact, just a trivia. So, a fact about Japan is, do you know Japan has made zero changes to their constitution? The number of constitutional amendments in Japanese constitution is zero. Because it's a very interesting process. I'll tell you how. Uh, it, this is a part of GS2. In GS2 mains examination, you read about comparison of constitutions. So I'll tell you something very interesting about Japan. So how Japanese constitution is amended. First, both the houses of the Japanese parliament. So Japanese parliament is called Diet. So both houses of Diet, that is both the houses of Japanese parliament, have to pass a bill by special majority. After that, this proposal for a constitutional amendment is then put to vote for the entire country. A referendum is held. In the referendum, the people have to say yes. Only after people say yes, then the constitution of Japan will be amended. So it's a very, very, very difficult thing to amend the constitution of Japan. But yes, as per the rules, they can amend it. But there have been zero constitutional amendments in Japan so far. But what they have done is, as I said, they have been changing their military stature. They have been changing their defense spending, etc. So it's an indication that they are not just being bound by that. Then I have a question from Ashu. What kind of question can be asked by UPSC in main exam from this topic? So Ashu, in these kind of question, in these kind of topics, questions can mainly be the implications on India. So, for example, the question can be Japan's increased military spending or Japan's more aggressive stature would bring some change in the Indo-Pacific region. What implication would it have on India? Things like that. Uh, Shantru is saying, why America intervened to make Japan constitution? Shantru, as I said, America after Second World War was fearful that Japan may want to take revenge. It, will, it may start the Third World War as it did with Germany and they did not want to take a chance there. Okay, let's go ahead then. The third article that we have here is about why is it that 1.5 degrees Celsius target is so, so, so critical. You keep on hearing about this, that we need to limit our average temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We cannot have it more than that. This is the maximum. And you keep on hearing about this time and time again. Why is, it the, why is this important? Why is it that 1.5 degrees Celsius is the target that many countries have set? So basically, when we say 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius or whatever, we are actually comparing the temperature with pre-industrial revolution era. Pre-industrial revolution era. So it is well known and it is well accepted around the world that the global temperatures started to increase with industrial revolution only. So if you compare the average temperature of the world in the pre-industrial revolution era and compare it with what happened afterwards, 
there is a big change that is where the temperature started to increase now the reason why this is in the news is that there are multiple reports that have come out which say that the 1.5 degree limit will be breached very soon the world meteorological organization has said between 2023 and 2027 earth's temperature will go beyond 1.5 degree celsius limit that we have put although it may come down slightly after that but we are much much faster when it comes to reaching this 1.5 degree celsius danger mark usually around the world the world wanted to control the temperature increase to 2 degree celsius but because the small island nations that will be submerged they are they were the ones at the maximum threat they were the ones who said that no target should not be 2.5 degree the target should be 1.5 degree and that is why in the very famous paris climate summit 2015 the same paris climate summit where india proposed international solar alliance if you remember in the same international solar alliance summit that is the 2015 paris summit india and the other world agreed that we should try and limit our temperature increase to 1.5 degree celsius and not to now the harmful impact of global temperature rise is being seen all around the world we saw the floods in pakistan very recently we see the heat waves the droughts how the sea level is increasing around the entire world there are many many cities around the world that are at very serious danger of being submerged all of this is because of that now the question is why are we missing the target time and time again first big reason why we are missing the target there is no compulsory target on any country so every country has set a target for itself but this is not a binding target india has set its target of net zero by 2070 china by 2060 many other nation by 2050 but if they don't achieve it nothing really would happen against them also many developed nations which are responsible for the temperature increase australia us japan have not really made a lot of progress that is why since they keep on blaming india china these kind of countries only to put brake on their emissions these countries have not really done enough second are extreme weather conditions linked to the temperature the short answer is yes even if you increase the average temperature by 2 degrees celsius there will be a very important change seen in the crop patterns climate change will have a major impact on the crop yields crop yields will decrease and in countries where there is already shortage of food there will be famine like situation this is why ethiopia nigeria south sudan somalia all of these are facing food shortages again food shortages are also because ukraine russia they were the two biggest grain exporting countries and in their own countries they are not being able to grow as much crop as they would have earlier because the global temperatures are increasing this is why the global temperature increase even beyond 1.5 degree celsius can be extremely extremely tough please don't imagine that oh if today's temperature is 30 degree tomorrow it will be 31.5 doesn't make a lot of difference to me it might not make a lot of difference to you in the manner that you live but it makes a lot of difference to the cropping pattern to the arctic ice caps this is where the problem starts also it will be extremely detrimental for coral reefs as well as for the wmo increase in the global temperature has caused a loss of up to 4 and a half trillion dollars in the past 50 years so even from the economic point of view there will always be problems which will be related to climate change what is the impact on india see india is no different although we are one of those countries that is working very hard to control our emissions despite being a developing country we have set a target of net zero which was not even bound, uh, binding on us we have even given a lot of push to solar green hydrogen etc so india is doing its bit but even then india is facing a lot of impact of increasing climate change in 2022 we witnessed extreme weather events for 80% of the days our monsoons are also wetter than usual so again it can result in flood like situation it can result in drought like situation as well also as per the international climate change performance index india is eighth with high perf in high performance nations 
So India is doing very, very well when it comes to fight against climate change. We are doing much, much better than most of our developing countries. We are at the eighth position right now in terms of how serious are we and what efforts are we making to curtail the impact of climate change. Also, if you can see here, the climate impact by even 0.5 degrees Celsius can be devastating. This is the impact of rise of temperature up to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if temperature rises by 2 degrees Celsius, it will be much, much more. For example, if temperature increased by 1.5 degrees Celsius, 70 to 90 percent of coral reefs will be destroyed. But if temperature increases by 2 degrees Celsius, 99 percent of coral reefs will be destroyed. Now, tell me something. Do you think if today we stop all our pollution, all our emissions, from tomorrow onwards, everything will be better? What do you think? If today India starts to cut down our emission, or let's say the entire world starts to cut down on the emissions, would tomorrow's situation become better? No, it will not happen. It takes a lot of time, so the carbon that you emit stays in the atmosphere for a long, long, long time. So even if you start making efforts today, you might see the impact after three, four decades. So what you are doing right now will be for the future generation, not for yourself. This is in fact one of the reasons why many countries are not very serious about this. Because they think, what will happen today? Nothing. Even if I cut down on my pollution or even if I emit more pollution, nothing will happen to me. This is why a lot of countries are not that serious. Because what you are doing is for the future generation. It's like buying an insurance policy. Insurance policy will not have any positive impact on you. You are buying it for the future generation that if they need money, they will be able to take money from that. So it's like that. Similarly, many countries are not really working very hard because they think it's not going to happen in their lifetime. They are not thinking about what will happen in the next generation. These are other impacts that you see when the temperature increases from 1.5 degrees Celsius as compared to 2 degrees Celsius, that is the global temperature of the earth. What will be the impact that will have here? Okay, before we move on to the prelims point of view, again, let me take up a few comments quickly. Ashu is saying India is a developing country, that's why it can't afford shifting process from dependency to fossil fuel to energy, clean energy. Ashu, yes, because of that, but I won't say just because we are a developing country. See, it's just because in the entire world, Solar has not really be become the ultimate solution to energy. The problem with solar is, yes, the capacity of producing solar energy has increased, but the problem that we have right now is, there is still no proper solution of how to store solar energy. So you make solar energy, but how do you store that? For example, in the daytime you make solar energy, right? But then how do you store that you use in the night time? that has to be solved. This is not really a puzzle that has been solved so far. You cannot have so many batteries that can store all that. You need to ensure that there is a proper affordable solution at the end of the day that allows you to use that energy later on. So solar has become much better. Cost of producing solar has become much cheaper. But again, the problem is how to store that. Storage solution has still not been found so far. Then I have a question. Nadeem is saying, why India still uses coal to produce electricity? Because Nadeem, coal is the most dependable way right now of making electricity. No other source of electricity right now can give you electricity 24-7. In the night time, if you need electricity, how will you use solar? In the area where there is not enough wind flowing, how will you produce electricity using wind? So at the end of the day, the problem why India is still using coal is, and we will continue to use coal for a long, long time, is because that is still the most dependable source of producing energy in India. It might doesn't sound good, but that is how it is. Then I have a question. World must move from clean energy to clean energy like nuclear power plants. Again, yes, nuclear power plants are cleaner, but many developed nations in the world are moving away from nuclear power plants after what happened with Japan the Fukushima disaster, because if there's a nuclear disaster and if a developed country, which is the nuclear leader like Japan, if they could not handle the disaster, how will other countries handle it? So yes, see, it has to be, the solution has to be a mix of everything. Solar 
with storage solutions, nuclear with a much safer technology. It has to be a combination of all of this. Okay, let's go ahead then. From the parents' point of view, we have a few news stories. Yesterday, the Parliament of India, the new building of the Parliament was inaugurated by the Prime Minister. There are a lot of articles written on this. This article also gives you a very interesting take on one of the things that are present in the new Parliament building. That is, the fall called pendulum has been installed in the new Parliament building. It is suspended. So, it's a pendulum, very long pendulum. The, it is attached to the ceiling of the constitutional gallery area. This is an art piece that has been designed by National Council of Science Museums in Kolkata. Now, if you have read science, even in your school time, I'm sure you would have seen pendulum in your labs, you would have some, some experiments on the labs as well. This Foucault pendulum is named after the French physicist who had first divided the apparatus. This is how it usually looks. This part of the pendulum that is a heavy ball attached at the end, this is called the bob, B-O-B. So what does it do? Basically, it swings across the imaginary surface and it is called the plane of the swing. So this will be called the plane of the swing in the surface. The pendulum behaves very differently depending upon how the pendulum is placed and in what part of the earth the pendulum is placed. For example, if you are standing on the earth's surface, you will not notice the planet's rotation. But instead, the plane of the swing will seem to rotate as the earth completes its one rotation. Now, I know for a fact that those who are not really from science background, they might not really find it the most easiest thing to understand. For those who are not being able to understand, the best solution is, if you are not being able to understand, just try and remember a couple of facts and you will be good enough to go. As you saw in the prelims exam yesterday, remembering a lot of facts can actually give you very good pointers. So, this pendulum is not really a pendulum can be set up anywhere. It has to be designed so that it is swinging in such a way that the motion of the bob is influenced only by gravity. So it is only due to gravity that it should work, only and only then it would have a proper swing. This is a pendulum that was designed, as I said, the objective to design this pendulum in the beginning in the 19th century was to demonstrate how the earth rotates because it traces the rotation of the earth from different points in the earth. It is suspended from a high roof and <clears throat> it shows the plane of the oscillation as it rotates. <coughs> Sorry. Because the new parliament building was inaugurated yesterday, all these small little factual informations do become important for the prelims examination. These things will not be asked in the mains exam, but mostly for the prelims exam. Another news story from the prelims exam is about India's performance in stunting, wasting and obesity. This article has a lot of numbers, a lot of data in terms of percentage, in terms of absolute numbers. Now, please understand something. When you read about these kind of articles, for example, it says stunting amongst children under 5 has dropped from 41.6 to 31.7%. I would not suggest you to remember each and every number to be exact. More importantly, you have to remember the trend. For example, the question might not really be about what percentage of children do we have as stunted children. What question can be asked is or what statement would be given is number of children under 5 who are stunted in India reduced from 2012 to 2022. So you just need to know how the trend has been changing, whether it has been increasing or decreasing or it has become stationary, that is how it usually works. So rather than focusing on exact numbers, exact data, I would really urge you to remember if the trend is increasing or decreasing. For example, for example, wasting. In 2022, 18.7% of population in India was wasting and the global burden Globally, the number of people who are wasted, about 49% are just in India. Those who don't know, Revati, I'll just tell you, don't worry. Those who don't know what is stunting, wasting, look at this and you will be able to understand. This is stunting, where people are too short for their age. So this should be the ideal size of a person of some age, but this is the real size. This is called stunting. So when you see, let's say, a person who is 20, uh, 20 years old but very sh small, very short in size, that would be stunting. Wasting means when people are too thin for their height. So they are, 
long but they are very very thin obesity as you know people who are overweight all these come in the category of malnutrition only a lot of people think that malnutrition is just when you don't have enough weight no even obesity is a form of malnutrition please remember that part even obesity is a part of malnutrition all of these come in the category of malnutrition so again coming back as i said don't really try and remember exact numbers if you can great for you it can help in the mains exam but for the prelims exam especially remember the trend the question will be for example in the past decade this fact has been decreasing or in the past decade this value has been increasing in india these kind of things is what you have to remember for example prevalence of obesity has increased in the decade so for obesity remember it has increased in the last decade or so increasing or decreasing please remember that that will be good enough for you to remember the government as you know has taken multiple initiatives in this regard to tackle malnutrition in india the poshan abhiyan the anemia mukt bharat abhiyan we also have the midday meal scheme the national food security program we have the matra vandana yojana and the integrated child development service as well schemes as you know are anyways important you just saw yesterday there were a few questions from the scheme there were the jani suraksha yojana scheme not a very new scheme even then there was question that was asked so again there are important government schemes and reports that will be asked time and time again please make sure that you keep a track of all these important news reports as well okay let me take up uh, the last set of questions if you have any today before i move on to the last article for the day yes pujita this pendulum is i won't say place it has been installed in the parliament so this pendulum so in the parliament we have a constitution gallery at the top it has been installed and the bob is at the basically at the bottom so it has been installed in the parliament <clears throat> those who joined late and you missed some part of discussion earlier you can see the recorded in the initial part of discussion we did discuss and i did give my comments about how yesterday's paper was so you can watch that part and you will get to know how we feel about yesterday's paper okay ankita is saying asian geopolitics could see fruitful result by india japan partnership right see ankita fruitful result from our point of view obviously we can see but again fruitful results are not fruitful for everyone for example china would not see as see this as a very fruitful partnership if you're talking from india's point of view absolutely from india's point of view a partnership with any country that is of the stature of japan would be good for us so it's nothing that can go against india if this kind of partnership comes in but again fruitful partnership for whom for us yes for china no for us yes for australia yes but again china would have different views on this mr dhacha if you have so many question about obesity i would really advise you to visit a doctor i cannot tell you how obesity can be cured i cannot tell you how it can be how it would lead to cancer i cannot tell you what are the reasons i think a doctor would advise you better <laughs> okay harsh is saying how to remember and which things are important for the scheme so any government schemes that you read about there are a few facts that you need to remember for example which is the ministry that is running the scheme or which is the uh, body that is running the scheme what exactly is the aim of the scheme what is the target and what is the target audience these are the few things that you can make a table of and you will be able to remember most of this okay let's go ahead then the last article that we have here for today is about dengue icmr that is the indian council for medical research is worried that dengue has spread to many many more parts of the country than it was earlier do you know in ladakh we did not have any dengue virus or dengue case until the last year ladakh was the only part of india the only urban territory or state where we still did not have a dengue case until last year and last year we have dengue case in ladakh as well so ladakh now also has two dengue cases again the reason why we this kind of disease spreads is as more and more people travel as more and more people go and visit the other places these diseases will go and spread 
and the sad part is now that the monsoon is coming in monsoon is usually the season where these kind of diseases like malaria dengue zika all of these again start by the way did you see yesterday also there was a question on the mosquito or how to control the prevalence of mosquito related viruses i hope all of you saw yesterday's question there was a question about this as well pretty difficult question but there was a question about this as well now the dengue virus we have discussed about this earlier as well the dengue virus is transmitted through female mosquitoes mainly the aedes aegypti mosquito they bite the human being and then when the other mosquito bites it that other mosquito also gets the virus so virus is spread from one place to the other not just by transmission from mosquito to mosquito but also when there is a person who has been you know, who has been caught with this virus that person can also be the carrier of the virus the zika virus has also been growing in multiple states in india and the icmr has said that we have to be very very cautious about how the disease will spread in the coming years sorry in the coming months because again we are at the onset of the monsoon right now we had discussed this earlier as well how the aedes aegypti mosquito starts this entire cycle of dengue one person is infected then the other mosquito that bites the person they then transmit the virus to the other person that is how this virus gets transmitted from one person to the other now again the interesting part with dengue is it's not present in all parts of the world there are certain geographical uh, come places where this virus is present and you will not see prevalent of these kind of mosquitoes in other parts of the world for example ideally these mosquitoes are found in latitudes of 35 degree north and 35 degree south elevation of about 1000 meters also these mosquitoes are pretty moody they only bite when they have their when they are in the mood to bite so their mood is they usually bite during the early morning and in the evening and again you would also know we usually have a habit to have mosquito repellents all out etc in the night time so they also are very smart they know in the night time when you go and sleep you will be able to or you will switch on your good night or all out etc so that is why the mosquitoes usually prefer attacking you in the early morning or in the evening and that is why you have to be much much more aware of that also humans are primary host of the virus and they can be non humans carrier of the virus as well we have anyways discussed a lot of these things about dengue earlier as well this brings us to the end of today's discussion there are a couple of practice questions now just a few comments from my end about yesterday's paper we have already discussed what the paper was we had an entire 3 hour session last night about analyzing the paper just a few things from today marks the beginning of a new cycle from today you have to now look forward rather than looking back if you are some of those who will be writing the prelims for the first time in 2024 learn from yesterday's paper see what kind of questions are asked the questions were not only really out of the world the options were different but again if you look at the questions the questions were not something that you have not heard of it's just that you have to be better prepared why because earlier you were able to eliminate now you can't eliminate because you are not 100% sure so if you are 100% sure about the answer you would anyways be able to get the answer the questions were not out of the world just that the option was slightly different so i would not say that you should change your preparation method your preparation method anyways was fine just that now you have to be even more sure of the answer before taking it that is the only way that you have to keep in mind also whatever happened yesterday if you are one of those who did give the paper yesterday as i said earlier it's just about 3 weeks of time even in less than 3 weeks the upsc will give you the prelims result please don't stop your preparation now just continue as you have been doing for just 3 more weeks wait for the prelims result don't lose hope right now don't think that i'll now stop preparing please make sure you see the result because in these 3 weeks if you don't study well and after 3 weeks you do qualify you will not be able to prepare well for the mains examination so make sure continue in the same manner for the next 3 weeks till the time result comes in and you will be able to get a much much better clarity and as always we are here for you to help you with anything that you require all the very best for this cycle because it starts from today thank you so much for joining in have a good day ahead bye bye jai hind